Every time I get to hear Virgil play, my mind is just drawn into his focus, his immense talent, his love for the art form, and how he pushes himself well into the 21st century, and how he pulls us along with him, which is incredible. Thanks so much for joining me, Vader Percussion Live. This is so great that we get a chance to do this every Tuesday. And today, I have got an artist that I am such a fan of at so many different levels of not only Virgil's incre incredible playing, but just the way he conducts his life and his perspective on health and physical fitness and how he pushes himself with his curiosity and his constant desire to learn. So would you please welcome the great Virgil Donati. Dom, <laughs> great to see you again. Virgil, it's always good to see you, man. You know, and, and just watching that clip up front, man, it just blows me away of just your the control you have over the instrument and how you are able to just any idea that comes to your mind, you're pulling it off in so many different ways with just the independence and the interdependence that you have. This is just so inspiring. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your uh, generous comments, but um, uh, I wouldn't say any idea that comes into my mind. There's still quite a few there that are trying to, squeeze themselves out <laughs> you have to keep you have to keep uh you have to keep on it you have to keep pushing and working on it you know and, and eventually that, they all expose themselves with that, that's what's really really um you know impressive about your verge that you have this incredible ability of being able to continue to push yourself to learn and to find out what these ideas are and you know when people constantly ask me they say well you know, when i go to an event and i'm performing your name always comes up. At every one of my events, your name comes up with a question on someone because they know we've we've played together and performed together over the past few years. And they'll say, you know, Virgil is from, from Melbourne, Australia. And I have to stop everyone and says, no, I'm sorry. Virgil Donati is not from Melbourne, Australia. And I tell this to all these people. I've had up to two or 3,000 people in an audience. I said, no, Virgil's not from Australia. And, and the audience looks at me. I said, no, no, you think he's from Australia originally. That's not where Virgil is from. I said, Virgil came from a planet called Krypton. And when the planet was about to explode, his parents put him in a rocket, and the rocket landed in Melbourne, Australia. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, oh, the, that's the line I use, Virgil, because it really is. You really have pushed this craft to a level of really – exciting potential and i've seen you through all the different designs of drum sets that you've had where you've had such an incredible ingenious way of how you challenge yourself even in your drum setup oh that's interesting that's an interesting observation i never really thought of that for me it was just a way of um you know uh moving moving pieces of drums around was always a way to to try and find a, a better way, a more comfortable way for me to express myself, you know, through the instrument. So generally, find there have been blocks of period where I've used the same setup for a long time yeah. and, and settled with that and then eventually decide, okay, something needs to change and so on. It's a, an evolution, basically, of, of the way I play and... and I think the way I play has something to do with the way I want to position the drums and, the, and the, how that evolves, you know. 
But that, that, that's what intrigues me about your, just your creative process of how you start to think musically. And then when you start to think musically, you alter your drum set to kind of fit that. I mean, I remember when we did a tour in Australia with Thomas Pridgen and you had the drums, you had the toms up above you and you, and you would move up in this direction, which was a movement that most drummers never even thought of to go up and around that way, both ways. And it was such a, it was almost like poetry in motion. It was so beautiful to watch other than even the sounds that you were able to pull out of the kit. So the sound options were incredible. And then the movement was incredible. It was literally like a, like a ballet of sound. It was really fantastic. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, the ballet in movement, it's like all these, these, these beautiful shapes that you can create. And that was part of the reason I experimented with that um, was uh, because I, I saw the drum as a very uh, horizontal instrument like everything's on a horizontal plane right yeah. symbols are a little higher yeah uh so that gives you a little bit of, of uh, a vertical shift but then by having the uh, air toms way above that yeah you know it gay it, it just brings in this other vertical element to the shapes that you create and it and it can be quite beautiful but uh i haven't i haven't really um you know, persisted with that setup uh, over the years, but uh, you know, it's still it's still there. The potential, the possibility, is still there to use. But I, I did enjoy some of the some of the things, and it does look it does look quite impressive. Uh, oh, it, it was it was hysterical, and and I had a laugh because Thomas Pridgen and I were, were on the side of the stage and we were performing, and Thomas had was holding my arm, and and when you started playing, the more excited he got, the more he dug his nails into my arm. And uh, you know, he, and he was just so blown away by it. So it was just so much fun. Let's oh, I love that guy. He's he's amazing. What a, what a what a personality and what a drummer. You know, I mean, it's just just uh, we had a great time on that tour. Yeah, such, a, such great fun, man. Great, great, great fun all the way on. Be fun as far as laughter and and traveling, and of course, fun as far as just hearing you guys play. To me, was just so inspiring. And leave it to Frank Corniola to organize these kind of events. You know. From Melbourne, Australia, you go back many, many years. Just talk about the early days, Virgil, as far as, you know, you, as a young kid playing drums, where did all this music stuff come from? Oh, well, I think it, it came initially from, from uh, my environment, my house, my home, my parents. They were both musicians. Um, they held band rehearsals in the home in Brunswick, in Melbourne, and I always participated. I wanted to be there. I sat down on the floor against the wall and uh, I would tap along, and it all began from there. And uh, eventually um, they bought me a, a, you know, a drum kit, a little white Trixton kit. <laughs> yeah. There it is. Well <laughs> And that's uh, that's where that's what I'm talking about. That was the time period. I was about three or four years old, and started playing and started doing gigs. That was actually a gig with my dad. As you can see, I'm wearing my mum uh, liked to uh, dress me up, uh, nice little white suits and a bow, bow tie, and uh, <laughs> and uh, and I play and I started playing and I kept playing and here I am now and I'm still playing, but. Um, <laughs> That's how, that's how it all began. Um, I started taking lessons when I was seven, several, a couple of teachers in Melbourne, some great guys, and uh, uh, I, and, and you brought up Frank Corniola, who, you know, we, we forged the friendship from, I guess, early teens. Mm. Uh, he was working in a music store in downtown Melbourne at the time. And, uh, you know, over the years, uh, he became a bigger and bigger influence on the drumming community in Australia and eventually uh, bought, as you know, bought his own drum store and or started, a, built built from the ground up his own yeah. drum store slash school and, uh, and, 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 uh, and it all went forward from there. Well, it's, it's kind of amazing. Well, Frank, first of all, you know, is, is this another incredible, energy a positive energy in the music industry and even though he's based in australia he is you know globally influential with not only drum scene magazine 
He built the building of Drum Tech in Melbourne and had all those teaching rooms built and a master classroom. The vision he had for teaching, master classroom, recording, selling product, and then putting on the Australia Ultimate Drummer Weekend for the past 25 years, you know, which is incredible to have a festival that long. And he's now coming out with his 100th you know, issue of Drum Scene Magazine soon, which is another. So there's an incredible discipline there. That's what you guys have. For some reason, I go down to Australia. There is such a, a hard work ethic to study and practice. When you were taking lessons at a younger age, were you putting in some serious practicing time? Well, yeah, I I was. I'm from a very young age, you know, I'd go to school, come home, do my homework, and the rest of the evening was uh, usually mainly music and drumming and yeah. and playing along with records and uh, and uh, and that's really that that set me up. And my father was was also, you know, kind of keeping an eye over me. For, uh, for quite a long time when I was around, you know, seven, eight, nine years old. And eventually he he, he didn't even, you know, he stopped looking over my shoulder because he knew I had this passion and I, I would be there regardless, you know, working. And uh, and uh, that's that's where it all came from. I, I don't know. I don't know why, why but uh, I guess uh, some of it is, is just... Uh, uh, innate, you know, just um, you have to have a certain um, inbuilt mechanism that uh, you know some some genetic uh, thing that that, that uh, predisposes you to this kind of uh, you know focus and attention. And I, I just loved it, you know. I, I would I felt disciplined even from a young age, you know. Like my buddies would always invite me out to go to do, you know, go out wherever, you know, go and play, play, uh, play football, go out to clubs, do this. And I, I, I really didn't do much of that, you know. Well, it's kind of interesting. I had the chance, the wonderful opportunity of meeting your mom and of course your sister too. And uh, you, know, you have such a, such a wonderful family. You came up with such a wonderful foundational loving and support for music, which is, is absolutely a, a beautiful beginning when did piano start coming into your life? Well, it started coming quite early, actually. My father um, uh, wanted me to be a piano player. He bought me the drum set, but he made it quite clear. He said, you can mess around with this for a while, but I want you to, to play piano. And uh, I actually... <laughs> I remember the day he had that discussion with me and I was still very young, maybe five or five years old or something, and I started crying, literally. I said, no, I'm going to play drums. And we reached a compromise eventually and uh, I did both, which I never regretted. So he started taking me for piano lessons when I was six at a very, very stern Russian piano teacher. So, you know, I was, I was learning classical piano and... Uh, I did that for about four or five years, and um, it, it served me well throughout my life. Though having that foundation in harmony and uh, and you know some some level of skill on the piano, so um, you know later along the road I got more involved with with composition, and therefore I uh, I look back and and thank my father for uh, yeah. really pushing me into it. Your, your piano skills are absolutely wonderful. I've heard you play, and and uh, I'm just you know uh, again you know uh, so impressed with your ability to be able to sit down and and play whether it's classical or whatever it is. You you really you have your way of around the keyboard, and and that theory and those scales and all of that came together that led into you composing intense music to this day. Um. Yeah, well, I, I I think it's only recently that 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 my um, composition skills have have really flourished a little. It took, takes a long time, you know. Music is a long process yeah. to develop that maturity and that that uh, to, you know complete understanding and and sense of 
uh, of all the nuance in music you know that's ju just it's a process as you know yeah. you know whether we're drummers or you know, whatever instrument we play we all go through that process and there there is no there are no shortcuts you know you just got to put in you got to put in the, the hard yards you got to put in the work and and so so it is with music and i was so spent so much time on drumming and focusing on that and um <clears throat> and along the way um you know i would kind of leave the piano behind and uh couldn't i just it's hard to squeeze everything in all the time but yeah. but more recently i'd say by recently i mean in the last uh say 15 years i i just really really started to hone in again on, on piano and uh and uh, and composition because i had more opportunities you know i started writing a lot of music after i moved to the us you know i was involved with so many bands where uh, i was doing a lot of the writing um, planet x for example and um and uh, there were some other projects along the way as well um and from there into my my solo records um so and I think the pinnacle of of that was uh, my record, The Dawn of Time, which was a project that I, I I always wanted to complete and it took a long time and it was an orchestral project. I, you know, I had these, I had this passion for symphonic music and I just wanted to, I um, uh, wanted to, Communicate. I felt that the, that the symphonic palette uh, was a great way to communicate the practicability of certain ideas I'd worked out in the abstract, you know, on the drums. I wanted to prove them realistically through my compositions, and uh, I felt like the symphonic. Uh, the symphonic medium was the best way to do that yeah. and uh that's how that record came about and uh it was quite a major work and took a long time but uh, uh yeah so but it's it's a brilliant work of art because you've got the palette of sounds that you have on that it's just so huge yeah well that's 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 the wonderful things that you've got layer you know you've got layers of of music that are able to support to support those ideas that I express through the drums, you know. Yeah. And so you've got all these you know you've got all the sections of the orchestra, and you can just create these beautiful layers of sounds and and rhythms and interplay and interaction and the you know the the uh, the lushness and the beautiful expressive nature of such a, a big orchestra you know um so i wanted to 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 go out of the uh the mainstream uh fusion you know rhythm section uh recording and uh, the only uh electric instrument on that is the electric bass i felt i, I still needed to have electric bass yeah. uh, i think you need that to tie in with the drums and uh so that was it yeah but well, what, what a powerful project but well, let's go let's go back to the to, to australia in your formative years you're growing up you're taking lessons name me some of the drummers that you were listening to that you were influenced by and some of the music that you were taking in at that time oh well uh you know i would uh every couple of weeks i'd go down downtown in melbourne to the import record shops and uh you know see what was what was out what was coming out and we're talking back in the 70s you know uh we were still you know still had vinyl the turntables and um i would go in and i'd be so excited to flip through all the vinyls and i'd see uh you know the blue the blue note recordings um you know, wayne shorter with uh uh, uh, with uh, <laughs> Wayne, who's the guy playing with Wayne? Um, uh, Alvin Jones, of course. Yes. 
Um, so album with Wayne, I'd, you know, I'd listen to, I'd, I'd buy, uh, it was, it was really, uh, the, 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 the time that, that fusion came to the fore, you know, so you had weather report, you had chicory of the Mar Vishnu orchestra, and I'd be buying all these records, you know, and, uh, take them home and, and learn, learn from them, play along with them, transcribe anything that I found, you know, I needed to really, really uh, delve into and uh, analyse. I would sit there with, you know, with the needle and the <laughs> turntable and go back. It's a lot, of course, it's a lot easier. We have much better tools to do that with today. <laughs> we had a... So no, to all the... All the uh, all the younger drummers out there, there's no excuse not to uh, develop your ears, you know, do some ear training, just listen to records and transcribe. It's a great way to learn, you know, just you're hearing things that, are, that could be elusive to you that you, you don't understand or you don't, really, well, we'll just focus, hone in on it, you know. Yeah. And, like, if we could do it with a turntable and, and a needle, you can certainly do it with the tools at your disposal nowadays you can slow down tracks you yeah know, you can do all kinds of things you can loop things it's so much easier even on youtube now that they've got that in the settings you can go there and you can slow down the video of youtube oh yeah that's right and you can take this down i mean like listen when we went to hear live musicians we went to hear buddy which play there was no slowing down anything you have to take in the focus and analyze it and figure it out there on the spot. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And uh, but uh, I still have uh, I, I still have an old manuscript of because I was a big fan of Philly Joe Jones, of course, and uh, I still have a manuscript with uh, a lot of transcriptions of, of his. Um, trade you know like fours and eight bar fills and yeah. I, I just loved the way he phrased he was so lyrical and and um and i remember when i had lessons with him when i finally got to new york when i was 19 20 years old traveled from melbourne to new york and uh, had lessons with philly and uh, and i showed him some of the transcriptions you know he was uh, that was a, a thrill for me well, you know, let's let's talk about that because at that time you know, we're talking now the early seventies. No, we're talking about the late seventies. The, the late 70s, late seventies when seventy nine when it was when I landed in New York. Okay. Seventy eight. No, it was mid seventy eight. June seventy eight. Yeah. June seventy eight. So it's interesting because at that time I also was in you know I, I live on Long Island so and I would go in all the time and I used to go here Philly a lot so. Many of the times around that time, I'm sure we were at the club at the same time hearing Philly Joe Jones play without knowing who that who we were. Really? Oh, I, my God. I used to go all the time to hear Philly. Well, what, in New York City? In New York I, City. And, and I we saw him play. Okay, there's two places I saw him play. Tell me if you were there. Rashid Ali's club in Soho. Oh, man. Oh, Rashid man. Rashid Ali's was the first place I saw him. Then we became friends. He gave me his number. I went to Philly to have lessons. And, and I saw him play a couple of times at the Playboy Club, Midtown. Apps of the Playboy Club, I went there many, many times to hear. Uh, uh, there were many great Playboy Club. Had to, great to hear music or? To oh. hear, well, <laughs> well, it's funny you mention that as a matter of fact. <laughs> but no. Philly Joe, um, I can remember going back uh, backstage with Philly Joe. He used to read a lot of the Wilcoxon book, and oh, yeah. we'd go back there. He'd open the book up to a page, hand me a pair of sticks, and we'd share the same pad. He would cut through the Wilcoxon book like it was a hot knife through warm butter, and I was stepping all over my joints, you know, you know, trying to keep up with him. And he would just flawlessly play this stuff. What a brilliant drummer! And there's a person. It's a perfect example of you transcribing Philly Joe that everyone that's hearing your voice right now should go and transcribe some Philly Joe. Yeah, yeah, some some wonderful play playing. And uh, uh, yeah, and back to the Playboy Club, I saw him playing there with uh, Bill Evans, which was another. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. 
I used to love him playing with Bill Evans and, and everything was just so, you know, Bill Evans, this was a whole nother great artist at what it was, but what great, you know, you made the move to New York, you, you came in, how long were you in New York for? I was there, I was in the US for 18 months uh, total and six months in New York, six or seven, and then came out to LA for a year. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that was my first major trip out of Australia. And then went back to Australia with the intention of returning fairly quickly. Yeah. Uh, but things took a different turn. You know, my career took off in Australia. I started one thing led to another and I got involved in uh, uh, several bands, a fairly very successful pop band called Southern Sons. And, yeah. and yeah. I kind of went through that and uh, all of a sudden, how many years had gone by? 15 years had gone by and... I finally came back to the U.S., and that's where I've stayed ever since. You know, when I was down there, I heard people talk about Southern Sun. So what, what kind of band was that? What, what, what kind of music? It was pop. Pop oh. rock. Yeah. And, in fact, we had a, uh, a reunion um, last – well, not last year. No one did anything last year, but uh, the year before. At end of 2018, we did a, a national tour some festivals in Australia, and uh, uh, it was great to reunite with the guys, very talented guys. Uh, the vocalist, Erwin uh, Thomas slash Jack Jones, yeah, goes by two names, but uh, he uh, he's singing on my newest record. We, we uh, reunited on more, on more levels than one. Yeah. He's singing and playing some guitar on uh, Ruination, just wonderful singer. I just love his... Uh, he, his, his tone, his approach to singing is quite unique. Um, and it was just, just what, what the music uh, was uh, in need of. And uh, he was the guy I had in mind. So it was great to reunite, you know, wonderful musician, yeah. It was really amazing, Virg. When I had uh, first heard you play live, it was at the Australian International Music Show. I think it was called AIM at the time. And it was in Sydney, and it was a big, you know, like a Nam type musical uh, festival. That's where I first met Frank Corneille, and I heard you play there. And I, I got to tell you something. I was just, I was just blown away. I was blown away when I watched you play. The same way I felt when I first heard Buddy, and when I first heard Billy Cobham. You know, when I first heard Buddy, it was like, you know, I was fourteen. I said, "What the heck is this?" Then I heard Cobham with Mahavishnu, and I went, "What the hell is this?" Then I hear you play a drum solo at AIM. And we had talked before, and you said, boy, if you can just check out what I'm doing. I said, boy, totally, I'm going to sit down. I sat down and was on the edge of my seat the entire performance. And at one point, I can remember talking to you afterwards, and I said, Verge, what are you doing here? And you said, well, I, you know, I, I, I live here. I said, no, that's not my question. What the hell are you doing here? We got to get you to America so you can have more of a, of a reach of what you're doing. And it was pretty amazing that when when you came by through Sabian and played through, my suggestion was to have you play at a distributor meeting that they had. And at that distributor okay. meeting, I pushed for that. I wanted Virgil to play there because I wanted all of these distributors to hear you. Once they heard you, everybody wanted you for clinics in their country. And it kind of was like, all of a sudden people were hearing about who was this guy? What's You hit the scene so hard and so intensely and you have stayed at that pace since then these past like 30 <laughs> years man. it's been absolutely incredible how do you keep this pace of this level of mental concentration and physical concentration how do you keep this pace up well i mean i'm as fit as a butcher's dog <laughs> <laughs> i've always i've always believed in uh you know, taking care of yourself first and foremost because what's it, you know, okay, how do you, how do, you do that? You, I mean, how do you do what you ask me? Yeah. You know, how do you keep up the stress, the pace, the, the, the commitments, the, you know, the demands? And, okay, well, first of all, you're putting your body through these stresses. So take care of it, yeah. you know? Don't abuse yourself, you know, just uh, I've always, I've never really drank alcohol, uh, never smoked, always been conscious of diet and um, 
you know, try, try through trial and error to learn more about that and, uh, um, and, you know, take certain supplements, kind of uh, educate yourself a little bit, look after this, you know, and then it will give you more in return. Yeah. And, and that's, that, that's been my, my philosophy and, and, it's, and it's worked quite fine. Now I'm in my, you know, I've turned 60. I'm, I'm in my 60s now. That's, that's pretty old. And that is pretty old, right? <laughs> Everyone out there agree? Yeah. <laughs> it's like it's the I mean it's it's younger than it used to be. Yeah. It's uh it's but um you know it's you if you look after yourself you get to a certain age and, and you don't regret it because you can keep being productive, you can keep being on top of your game, you know. And uh, I think I've achieved that part of it. Now let's see what kind of game I can play. You know, that's yeah. who knows. <laughs> but there's a, a still, of- you know, right now. I still have that that passion, that fire. Uh, who knows if it if it slowly extinguishes? You know, but um, but I think thus far, a, as you, Dom, you you know, you're you're always so you know energetic and. and and so you know, always out there doing and being creative and being. So you're you're on the same page, you know. So you understand, and, and I'm sure you look after yourself, don't yeah. you? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, every every morning my my wife makes me a mixture of spinach and fruits and all these wonderful healthy things, and I, I drink that every morning. And I, I keep on thinking, I think she's trying to poison me. Is what I think what's happening. So. I'm, <laughs> What's going on? But I'm drinking this stuff, and uh, and I feel great. And you know, when you feel great and you have a high energy level because of that, then you can do things and you want to do things. I think that's a that's something which you have. But you have a discipline that is so incredible in how you live your life and how you practice. What is your practice discipline like? Oh, uh, look, it's it's very. Um... It's very consistent. Yeah, that's yeah. one thing which you know over the years it's been consistent. I've always felt the need to practice because that's the only way I can uh, you know you can express what uh, what is still trapped in your mind. Um, you know, it's one thing having ideas and, and 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 hearing things, but it's another it's another thing. You know, finding a way for them to come out and. Uh, the only way to do that is practice, and and uh, I've just you know I've just been uh, I I enjoy I enjoy my uh, my isolation time you know just being in a practice room alone and then and working on things and um, but you know over the years that people ask you know the the the, the question follows. Um, so what, how do you, how do you practice? What do you practice? Well, that, that's, that's a difficult question to answer because it keeps changing according to what your level is and, and what your, um, you know, what your goals are and, and what, uh, what your interests are musically. And uh, there's so many, there's so many things that, uh, that come into play, but, but um well, I guess one of the important things to, to, to mention and to talk about is the the fact that uh, we have so much information always coming our way now, you know, kids. You know, if I was, I don't know how I would evolve as a drummer now if I was younger, you know, if I was, if I was growing up now because... You've just got so many more influences. You've got uh, so much content constantly yeah, yeah. coming your way, being you know just just in your face, and um, and I think in a way that that probably also develops a certain amount of uh, it, it takes away from. I think people, you know, maybe younger musicians might lack the patience. They want to get there right away. They say, "Oh, it's great playing, great licks," and mm-hmm. and maybe if you don't manage it well, you might you might skip 
the fundamentals. So that's the one thing I would say is to, to just always work on the fundamentals first um, and don't try and, um, and, and, you know, just jump too far ahead yeah. in an attempt to, to play fast or to play certain licks or, uh, you know, just just be a be a what we call we keep saying this term musical musical drummer, but that that's again that's a very that's a very broad term, you know. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Um, I just believe that you know go back to the fundamentals, seek it, seek out a good teacher, try several teachers, you know, see what different perspectives are, and um, from that you can learn and and, and find your way. Well, this is great advice, Virgil, and I want everyone to really kind of hear this because this is really what it takes as how you're, the plans of what, you know, you got to find out where you want to go first and then map out the plan to achieve that. And everyone has a different place that they want to go to. And of course, everyone wants to move faster. Listen, years ago when we were younger, we had a fight to try and find information. Now, yeah. now information is being blasted at our face. It's coming at us at such a pace. We have too much. It's overwhelming. Oh yeah, I mean there, there are so many great books out there that we'll never read because yeah. just there isn't time. Yeah. You know, I see all these books. Oh yeah, I want to buy. I want to buy that. I want to let me get on Amazon. Let me order these books. Yeah. And now it's like no, I, I you know I've got a bookshelf full of books that I can't even get around to reading because yeah. it's just too much information. Yeah. Video clips. I see uh, so many drummers playing some beautiful stuff and, and recording, you know, and other musicians, guitar players, bass players. And well, that's where Instagram is quite handy because, you know, it's usually just snippets, you know, small, yeah. you know, small packets of information coming your way. And it's a shame in a way, but in another way, it, it's good because you do get an overall view of what people are doing creatively out there. Yeah. Um, but um you know, to sit down and listen to a whole record, you know, like a whole symphony, or a, it just seems it's becoming like foreign territory now because there's so much to to try and sift through. You know. Yeah. And I, you know, for example, I had just in the last, literally in the last month, I've had two, three, four, five friends send new records. That they've made, and they, you know, they of course. I mean, they're friends of mine. I want to listen to them, but getting around to listen to a whole, I mean, yeah. a whole record, you know, yeah. sixty minutes of music. Yeah, that's that's five hours yeah. that I've got to sit down and listen. So, where do you do it? You do it in the car. You do it, you know, maybe a track or two at a time on the headphones yeah. late at night. I mean, I'm just, you know, you're working. It's so hard to <laughs> do any, to do anything anymore. You know, it, 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 life is just full of it's full. So we full have to, we have to try and manage that. You know, you know, people talk about time management. I always say it's not really time management. You can't manage time. It's life management that you have to manage inside that time to try to get to everything in the process. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's 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 ridiculous. It's, you you have played with three of my my all time favorite guitar players. Tommy Emmanuel, Steve Vai, and Alan's Holworth, Alan Holsworth. Just give me a quick one minute on each of them on what it was like to work with Tommy Emmanuel. Oh, excuse me, that's my. <laughs> uh, um, Tommy Emmanuel, remarkable human being. Yeah, he is a powder. He's just a powder keg. Energy. I mean. Amazing energy. He he and his brother Phil Emanuel. Yeah. Um, I remember seeing them in clubs in Melbourne years and years and years ago. And just even back then, just blown away at what these guys were doing. It was just it was just beautiful. And uh, later on, um, I collaborated with um, with Tommy on one of his records and actually wrote a tune for him. And you know he. I wrote I wrote the piece and he wrote a melody and um, so we co-wrote this piece. The record, the album was called The Journey, beautiful record. And uh, we did a tour. I did one, I did one, maybe two tours with him. Um, 
and that this is going back to the early 90s perhaps yeah. but uh amazing amazing guitarist if no if, if you haven't seen tommy uh he does a lot of solo shows now so he's just you know, yeah. acoustic guitar just just you know go to mr google and ask to see absolutely, absolutely. Hey, amazing He's, he's now living in Nashville, and he's uh, playing better than ever and stronger than ever. So, uh, But he's, he's just one of my favorite favorite, And he also loves drums. He's a huge drumming fan. Oh, yeah. He can play drums. He can play yeah, drums. Yeah. He's a really good player. What was it like with Steve Vai? Steve Vai, well, I'd been, uh, I guess I'd been in, the, in L.A. in the U.S. at that stage for about four or maybe five years. And um, got the call one day from Steve, and I thought, oh, Steve, I oh, great. Um, and he asked me uh, if I'd be interested in, uh, you know, working with him, doing a tour, and um, went for an audition. Basically, uh, it was Bill, Billy. It was a time when Billy Sheehan reunited with him. Nice. So Billy and I went to his studio in Hollywood, and uh, we jammed for about. I don't know, 40, 40 minutes, 45 minutes, maybe more. Um, we just played, just jammed on anything, didn't actually play tunes. <laughs> and, um, and it was fabulous, and that was it. So that was the, the band, and we toured, did two tours with him, uh, a G3 tour, that was the first tour we did in the US, and then we did a world tour, you know, take, took in Asia, Europe, UK, and... Uh, some more gigs in the US, um, and that was around 2001. And and uh, yeah, great musician, a wonderful, uh, again, very focused guy, just yeah. a huge output, you know, yeah. and um, you know, great strict stage presence. He's uh, he's a you know, iconic guitar hero, yeah, big time, rock star. Sure. he's a rock star, you know, it's just amazing, yeah. you know, and uh. And then um, Alan Holsworth, yeah. uh, who I can unequivocally say was, was one of my biggest inspirations um, and probably the biggest musical thrill of my life to, to be asked by him to, to, to work with him and uh, um, in his unimitable manner manner you know, he's, he's very uh very interesting person a wonderful wonderful human being and yeah, apart yeah. from being an absolute genius yeah. on guitar um i mean he was uh i think you could say he was a revolutionary yeah truly was a true revolutionary against the mainstream and self admittedly too you know he, he he didn't really go with the dominant tendency and the trends mm -hmm. on guitar you know he just took it somewhere else you know and uh i think he reformed a lot of judgments on you know about about the way you play guitar you know and uh influenced so many people so many people some of the greatest guitarists have been influenced, you know. Absolutely, by absolutely. I mean, and 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 he stayed true to himself right to the end. Oh, totally. Mm -hmm. uh, we, you know, we. He was he was a wonderful band leader too. You know, he really placed faith in his musicians. He allowed you a hundred percent freedom. Mm -hmm. um, and he would go wherever you took it, you know, and therefore you can hear his music being, you know, ver various uh, phases of his, his uh, career and his band. You can hear the different uh, interpretations of his music mm. because it just, it did just that. He allowed you freedom to, to, to be yourself. And he was a very generous man, very generous. And, uh, uh, he's he's greatly missed, greatly missed. Yeah, 
what a what what a what a gift he gave us. But I mean, you had the chance to play with these artists that is just you know for yourself in the drumming world, you have have reached legendary status by working with these great artists and being able to even you know create with them and push them, which has been exciting to hear as I've witnessed some of those performances. I mean, you just you just you just went with them and just led them to areas that that were just absolutely euphoric. It really was magical. Oh, well, thank you for uh, <laughs> really for that. Uh, um, you know, I mean, I don't know when I'm doing when I'm out there, I'm just I'm just playing. I'm just trying to bring bring something to the table. And uh, the wonderful thing about Alan's music in particular is, is that it, that it is so expressive on many levels. You know, it's just it's 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 great music to play to there's there, there's so 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 many air so many so much openness you know and and the ability to to stretch yourself to take it to 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 the limits you know and uh and that that's that's the beautiful thing about playing you know music that that uh is improvisational. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, really, and that that takes you know that takes another level of skill, you know, to do it really well. Absolutely, absolutely. Let's. Uh, we've got a handful of people that have some questions, Virgil. You, you know, we, we've oh. got people that are listening from all literally around the world. So here's Sion Prochota, I believe. A question for Virgil: How would you suggest to incorporate the rather progressive style of playing you know while songwriting i always find it to be difficult so how do you how do you incorporate you know you know your progressive style into your music when you're composing well first of all um i assume he means he's, he's trying to write creative uh not creative but trying to write uh, progressive music so if you're if 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 your goal is to write progressive music, then um, first of all, how are you writing the music? Uh, do you actually play another instrument apart from drumming? Uh, do you are you trying to uh, to use your drumming ideas to write around? Um, I mean, it's a very Difficult question to answer on, on various levels, but in, in a nutshell, what comes out when you write is coming from here. It's coming from your heart, from your feelings. It can't be contrived. You can't just sit down and have no inspiration and, and hear nothing and just think, oh, you know, hit a few notes on the piano and say, oh, how, how do I start? What do I do? No, you, you have to have some in, internal inspiration. It's a very difficult thing to ex explain. But, but if you're a drummer, it can come from a drum, you know, a rhythm, a drum groove or something that you, that you think sounds and feels good and you, th and you think, oh, how would this feel how would this sound if i put it to the service of music can i perhaps record yourself playing something put that in your door loop it and then try and you know if you play guitar or bass or or keyboard try and come up with some parts around that use that as a starting point and then continually refine yeah you know continually let it give it time don't rush composition you know you want you want to you want the you want the ideas to be strong and uh and you know to 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 have a depth to them you know well that's the that's the key to continually refine that's a great great uh that's a great part of the process yeah let's go to another question let's see if we can pull up another question here 
from Maxim Dioman, who's a wonderful drummer in Kiev, Ukraine, is a dear a friend of mine and a former student of mine and, and a great teacher out there. I have a question. What do you think, what is better to transcribe music yourself or read it from a book or both? Hi, Maxim. Um, yes, I think it's better to transcribe yourself yeah. for the reasons I mentioned earlier, which is developing your ear, ear training. Um, you can use a book to, uh, to confirm what you've transcribed and to compare if you're transcribing something that's available in a book, that is. But I, I, think, um, I think it's important to be able to, to hear things and and mentally place them on a sheet of music. If you're a reader, I mean, first of all, there are a lot of musicians who do not read, therefore you cannot write or transcribe. Yeah. So you learn by listening. And that's, again, developing ears. So if you can do that, you're probably even a step ahead. You know, you're like, wow, I'm going to skip the process of putting the notes on paper for reference, and I'm just going to learn it and memorize it as I'm hearing it. That's, you know, a lot of guys are doing that too. Yeah. But, um, but I think there are some advantages in, in, in having the ability to read and write. So I'd say, yeah, transcribe. Fantastic. Thank you, Maxim. Let's try one more. Mike Belays, is it a tough choice to include vocals on an original song for you, or do you hear it in the vision? Is that a part of the process? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's part of the process in terms of if I know I'm writing a vocal song, then, you know, you're, you're writing uh, in an attempt to, to create the space for that vocal. I mean, I'm, I'm writing music. You know, you might start with a vocal melody or usually I've got to say in my case, I, I start with the, the music itself, yeah. foundation. And and as you're doing that, you start hearing melodies or vocal potential melodies at least. And again, it comes down to refining. So, um, but but be be aware that you've got to write with the vocal in mind. Uh, so you, know, you write you write themes, you write chord changes. Is this a verse? Is it a chorus? Is there going to be a pre-chorus? Uh, it's going to be an instrumental section, you know. It's just, you know, you, you just you just uh, figure it out in your head. <laughs> nice. And look, look. Another point. Another point to make about writing and songwriting is that what level are you at musically? What are you hearing? What is your ability? You know that. You know, if you're struggling, well, you're probably still along the developing your skills. You're developing your ability to. To, to improvise, to be able to hear things, to make sense of things. It's probably a slower process. You know, it, it's a bit frustrating. As, as playing, you know, you can draw analogies to playing, you know, to technique on drums, to sitting behind a drum kit and trying to make it all happen. You know, it's years of work and years of frustration and, and trying to make things come out. And, and it's the same with writing. You know, it's a practice skill you get better and better at it the more you do it you cannot expect to sit down and just say oh, i've decided i'm going to be a drummer who writes my own music yeah. and come out with masterpieces you know it, it all goes back to what's in here what are you hearing what's what knowledge do you have what what understanding do you have it's a very very complex you know uh, Procedure, really, you know. So that's why we just spend our lives making music, creating, and as you go along, you get better and better. Well, that's a that's a great result, and I have uh, you know when I hear some of your early stuff, I love that, and I hear some of the stuff that you did, you know, lately, and I love that too. So you've got a pretty good consistent range of how you've been able to keep a great level of exciting composition and performance up consistently that's pretty amazing <laughs> any more questions let's try one more can we have one more question here yeah 
What aspect of the career has been most challenging for you? Maybe the least natural. Aspect of, the, of, of my career has been the most challenging for me. Look, I, I, in all honesty, I think everything has been challenging. <laughs> It's a huge challenge. This is why we get up every day and we we face it head on. You jump in there and you do it. It's a challenge. If it wasn't a challenge, we wouldn't need to get up and get behind that drum kit. See those kids behind Dom there? <laughs> They're there for a reason. This is a, a studio, a practice room, yeah. because you've got to face that challenge every day. Um, you know, nothing, nothing really sticks out as a one particular huge challenge. It's all been a big challenge. And again, once you're on the path, you start to unravel the difficulties. You start to, to put, um, two and two together. Things start to make sense bit by bit. Um, and then, uh, you know, you you know, just just try and maintain some sort of humility. Just just look at what's going on around and and have, you know, have have an open mind. Be respectful of what people have done and tried to do, and be and and try and have some empathy. Uh, you can you can disagree. You can have your taste might prefer one thing to another, but. But try, try and keep that open mind and some sort of equanimity and, and uh, just go along, you know, be, be on that path. And, and uh, don't be afraid if you feel frustrations because we all do, yeah. you know. I still do even at this point, you know, trying to work through things. So it, it's part of the process. Well said. I've got a question for you. You've been with Vader for many, many years, and you now play the assault stick, but you also had the powerhouse and the shredder. So just talk about the different sticks that you have used and have evolved and developed. Okay. So the the one I use mainly is um, the assault. Yeah. Uh, that was the the last one we developed. Um, that's it right there, okay. <laughs> full loud. But it can be it can be full and soft if you need it to be as well, you know. Yeah. Depending on what what's in your hands, you know, how your hands can, can control them. But um uh and years and years ago when I first teamed up with, with Vader, uh I I spoke to Alan about uh creating a, a snare drum practice stick because I was really into the uh, the, mar the marching band uh, technique then. I was having lessons with Rob Carson at the time and they used such big sticks. So we came up with the shedder, right, the shedder, which is a shorter stick and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a fairly hefty stick, and it's a, but it's a very beautifully balanced stick and I, I like it. So occasionally I'll pull that one out some snare drum practice and uh i think powerhouse was the predecessor to the assault stick yeah uh so that one is still around so um let's see this one's 16 and a quarter what uh can you can we compare that to the the assault stick 16 and three eighths yeah, yeah. So slightly longer slightly yeah. longer so um yeah if you like if you like that the stick to be a little more balanced in terms of having more weight on the back end the top side towards you know closer to your hand then you go probably go for the shorter ones um but um i'm quite used to that extra length now and it, it feels good to me so boy fantastic photos really really fantastic photos here of you in action and uh, even photos of your kit, of the different kit setup. Look at that. That's absolutely beautiful. <laughs> wow. Yes, that's my magenta fade to gray. 
I have a green fade to grey, which is in Europe. I have a red fade to grey, which is in Nashville. And I have also a blue fade to grey. So it's a little quirk of mine. I like I like grey, but I can never quite decide what colour to match and mix with it. So well, I love the fact that you like gray because the older I get, the more I'm starting to see of it. So uh, that works out real, real nice. <laughs> Virg, let me ask you the last final question. What motivates you? What drives you every day when you get up? What is it the force that, that allows us to enjoy the great talent and to be blessed to be living in the time of a Virgil Donati? What freaking drives you? Oh, man. I, uh, boredom. <laughs> boredom drives me. <laughs> I, I don't know what else to do. <laughs> I, I I just you know like I've got a I've got a couch back there I could just spend all day on, <laughs> but I decide not to. <laughs> so I have my, my piano here. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I I do a bit of piano practice in the, well whenever I can, but I try and do some in the morning when I'm here in LA. Um, and then um, it's it's off to the studio um, in North Hollywood, which is uh, about 20, 20 minute drive from here, twenty five minute drive, and uh, spend time. Look, it's uh, I I just love I love the feeling of being in command of what you do, mm. and I love the fact. That uh, I'm I'm an artist that I I can create every day. Yeah. That that excites me. The fact that mm. you, you never know what's coming next, and the potential. You know, it keeps changing. On, you know, week to week, month to month, year to year, and and I I, I guess that kind of feeds me. That fuels me. It's like I want to play better. I, I want to understand better. I want to create you know want to combine my four limbs in better ways and new ways and different ways and and um it just it's just um but you know what i first said boredom is is a big part of it i mean it's you find a purpose in life right yeah and 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 we're blessed to be in a, in a creative you know endeavor yeah. and you know so many people don't have that it, you know, work for them may be just a way to survive, you know. And, and for us, it's a way to survive, but it's also a fulfilling way to yeah. live life. So that's it. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. Virg, thanks so much. Virgildonati.com. I want everyone to go by there, check out his, his merch and everything, but also everyone pick up Double Bass Drum Freedom. Pick up Verge's book. It is absolutely fantastic. I use it with all of my students. It is absolutely important to have to understand more about playing double bass and just even just even more just developing your feet to a higher level. So all that stuff here too. VirgilDenali.com. Virgil, I thank you so much. I have enjoyed all the times that we have spent together and played together and all the times that I've had to listen to you with your band at many occasions all around the world and all the different countries that we've traveled to. It's always a pleasure and an honor. And I thank you also for your humility. I love the fact that you really you, you really are still pushing yourself to a higher level and that for sure inspires us all. Well thank you, Dom. It's it's great to uh, reconnect with you here today. And I just want to, you know, also put out a word to Vader and they've always been so supportive over the years. Uh, I've been playing Vader since about 96 now. It's 25, 25 year anniversary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Long time. Uh, just wonderful people uh, at the company and uh, we've forged a strong friendship and uh, I just thank them for their continued support yeah. um, and their great product. Okay, guys. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Virg. Thanks, thanks so much. Fantastic. Boy, you know, what's amazing is, you know, of course, Alan Vader makes incredible quality product. And for that wood manufactured the way it is to lay in the hands of Virgil Donati, you know it's got to be right consistently, which it is. So it's fantastic. You know, I thank Virgil so much. All of you that joined us here, it's just so great. From We've got people from 
several countries all around the world, and it's an incredible amount of people that have joined us here. And to hear the words of Virgil Donati, go back and listen to this again, and listen to the depth of the wisdom that Virgil has shared with us, because he really is uh, it's such a unique individual that is such a dedicated and committed artist that, as I said earlier, we are blessed to be living in the time of a Virgil Donati. So everyone, go out there, purchase all of his product, listen to his music, go hear him live. When we get out of this crazy pandemic and you hear Virgil playing, if he's anywhere in a driving distance, even if it takes you a week to get there in a car, drive and go there and hear Virgil. It will be well worth the experience. On behalf of Vader, I thank you all so much for joining us, and I'll see you next week. We'll do it again. Bring it on. Thanks so much, guys. Bye-bye.